12 and Ezekiel 47. They, they sung that song this morning. I was thinking about that song this week. I've never heard them sing that before that I recall. Step into the waters. I've heard it, but I don't know if I've ever heard Our Lady sing it. But I was thinking about it this week. I said, man, I, I would like for them to sing that this week, but then forgot about it. And I looked up at the screen, step into the waters. Well, Brother Henry has talked about step into the waters. Brother Lies has talked about stepping into the waters. Sister Mary has shared with us, I believe, about stepping into the waters. Well, I want us to look back again this morning, Ezekiel 47. We're going to get there in a few moments, but we're going to start off in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to start off with this head headgear because I need it because I'm going to need my hands here in a few moments, a little uh, presentation that I'm going to do. But we want to look in Romans chapter 12, and we're going to look at the first two verses. I just, just was praying from, during revival. Uh, this, it seemed like these verses in, in Ezekiel kept coming up, and, and I just couldn't get away from them, and just praying about it, praying about it, and praying about it. And I, I just felt the Lord burn this in my heart for today, and uh, if you're planning on getting out of here at 12 o'clock, forget it. The only way you're going to get out of here at 12 o'clock today is if you just leave. And I wouldn't recommend you do so because God wants to do something here today. He, he wants to speak to us and he wants to minister to us and he wants to, to quicken us. He wants to change us, but uh, we've got to be ready for it. Romans 12, 1 and 2, many can quote it. I beseech you, therefore, brethren... By the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Our ultimate goal and God's command to us is to be in His perfect will. But there is also a good and an acceptable will of God. And I want to talk to you this morning of what I feel like God has laid upon my heart for this message today. Prove it is my title today. Prove it. Will you stretch your hands towards heaven? Let's ask God to speak to us today. Father, we're desperate people in need of you today, Lord. Oh, Lamb of God, we're hungry people in need of being feeling, as our brother preached to us yesterday at the youth service, God. We're thirsty people in need of a refreshing of your spirit, God. Quench that thirst today. I praise you and thank you for the privilege that I have to stand in this pulpit, to come as a yielded vessel. And I present myself before you again, a vessel in which you can use. And I ask you, Heavenly Father, just to anoint me to preach this word and anoint hearts to receive this word. Draw us closer to you and your will and your way, your purpose and your plan will be fulfilled in the house of God today. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We, sit, we read there in the second part of that verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be, but be tr- transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Once again, ultimately, our goal and God's command for us is for that latter end, for that third uh, will there, the perfect will of God. In the perfect will of God, you're fulfilling ministry. In the perfect will of God, you're fulfilling your destiny. In the perfect will of God, uh, you're walking in your calling. In the perfect will of God, uh, you're out there in the depths. Uh, You've not just stepped into the water, but you've waded out a little bit deeper. Uh, so as we look here, uh, this is what Paul uh, is challenging the Ephesians with. In Ephesians 4, 11 and 13, uh, he said this. He gave some uh, preachers. Why? Because God's ultimate goal and command is for us to be perfect. Uh, but he's not just saying figure it out. You know, God said, be ye perfect as I am perfect. And we know that word perfect means mature. Walk in your maturity. Uh, be mature. Be perfect as I am perfect. Uh, walk in that level of maturity where you are in your spiritual walk. Uh, but don't settle for that level. But go all the way uh, to that perfection. Uh, so he tells us all this. Uh, but he says he's given us what we need to get to that place. Uh, he said and he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. For what? What are you here for today, Pastor? Why do we even have you here? 
Somebody told me one time, we don't need a pastor. So we don't need a preacher. Said that was Old Testament time, that, that we don't have to pay tithes, uh, we don't have to attend a church, and we don't need a pastor or preacher anymore. But that's not what Paul wrote here. Paul said that we need, uh, that God has given, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists uh, and some pastors and teachers. Uh, so can I tell you today, I'm here because God gave me to you. I've been given some gifts before that I didn't like. Maybe that's you this morning, but nevertheless, I, I am God's gift to you. I've never been God's gift to women, uh, but I am God's gift to you. Uh, and God has given me, uh, and I take that uh, responsibility not lightly. He has given a purpose. Uh, and you say, well, if you're God's gift to me, uh, you can turn my sermon title on me this morning uh, and say, prove it. Uh, well, as I was praying Psalm 61, uh, and Jesus repeating it in Luke chapter 4, this morning, uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me uh, to preach this gospel. Uh, and I hope this morning that through the preached Word of God, uh, that I can prove to you uh, that God has put a pastor in your life uh, and placed the church in your path uh, for a purpose and a reason. Uh, he said that He did this for a purpose, uh, for the perfecting of the saints. Uh, God wants not just those that feel called in the ministry, uh, but every man, woman, boy, and girl that's here today uh, to walk in the perfect will of God. But there is a process. You don't just dive into the perfect will of God. He said that they may prove what is that? Good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You must go through the good and the acceptable to get to the perfect. For what? For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Listen, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, you can turn with me if you want to. Sister Amy will have it up on the screen. But Ezekiel 47, verses 3 through 6. Uh, Brother Henry has preached it deep, calling out to deep. Brother Elijah preached it, and he took Brother Draven across here uh, into deep waters. Uh, these are great men of God. Brother Henry's an older man of God. Brother Elijah's a young man of God. Uh, I, I don't want to take nothing away from them and their messages and what they preached. Uh, but as they was preaching and as I was praying, uh, God began to show me some more things uh, from a pastor perspective of that ver those verses. Uh, so I began praying and thinking about it, and it's just been stirring in my heart. Uh, and then God took and tied Ezekiel 47 uh, into Romans chapter 12. Uh, and for me, I saw nowhere that those two could mesh together uh, until God began to speak to me and deal with me about this message. Uh, so I want to take a few moments this morning, an hour and a half or so, uh, and share with you uh, how these two scriptures come together. Uh, and so let's just read it this morning. Ezekiel Ezekiel 47, verse 3 uh, through 6. He said, And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubics, and he brought me through the waters. The waters were through the ankles. Again, he measured a thousand cubics, a thousand, and brought me through the waters. The waters were to the knees. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters were to the loins. Afterwards, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over, for the waters were risen, waters to swim in a river that could not be passed over. He said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. Now, Sister Amy, I want you to, to scroll these verses. I'm going to try to read them off screen. My helper's going to come. Last week, I used Brother George. No offense to Brother George, but I'm glad that he's not my volunteer this week because you'll see in a minute why I'm glad that he's not my volunteer. Come stand up here, Brother Draven, just here on this second step. That's good. So Brother Draven is there, and God was showing Ezekiel something in this verse of Scripture. Uh, and actually what I believe that God was showing Ezekiel uh, is that Ezekiel was ultimately to be the man with the measuring stick in his hand, but he had to show the man of God. 
through Jeremiah. You, you can read some of the crazy things that God called Jeremiah to do, and he was showing him some things through that and through Isaiah and through all the prophets. Uh, well, he's speaking here to, to Ezekiel, and he tells him there in verse 3 uh, that there was a man uh, that had a line in his hand. Well, I don't have a measuring. I was going to see if somebody had one of them old style, but I just got the, the little handheld measuring tape that I want to use this morning. He said he had the, land, hand, the, the, the line in his hand, the measuring stick in his hand, uh, that he had it there. So I'm just going to go through a little skit this morning with Draven helping me, uh, and then we're going to get into the message. I'm not going to break down. I thought about taking him each deal and then preaching along the way, but we're just going to go through this whole skit this morning first, uh, and then I'm going to come back and break it down and preach it for you, all right? So here's what happened. Verse 3, uh, and when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, uh, he measured a thousand cubics. Here, help me out. Hold that. He measured out a thousand cubics. Thank you. So he counted the cost. He measured it out. But look, look what it says there. He measured a thousand cubics. And what did he do? He didn't say, walk with me. He brought me. I'm, th- I'm glad that's not Brother George. And anybody don't know Brother George, Brother George up here. He brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. And then he measured again. Thank you. Verse 4 says, Again, he measured a thousand. What did he do? He didn't say, come on, but... He brought me through, lose this one, the waters, and they were to the knees. And again, he brought me through the waters. He measured. He came, and what did he do? He didn't say, come on deeper. It's still up to me. It's still up to me. He brought me through, and they were to the loins. Verse 5. Afterward, we we'll measure it again, came to the waters, brought him to it, and he said, hold on. Those are waters to swim in. that cannot be passed over. Verse 6, and he said unto me, son of man, has thou seen this? And then he brought me. Wait a minute, water swim ends that way. Nope, he brought me to the brink of the river. Thank you, brother. He brought me to the brink of the river. Did you catch all that? Because I I do not want to do it again. I'm going to need some Tylenol and some Advil. I'm glad it wasn't Brother George. But what he did there, what we see illustrated there, and we've heard it. I've heard it preached my whole life, and you've heard it preached if you've been in church any amount of time. That God has called us into deep waters, and he walked us into the deep waters. But what that scripture says is he brought me. He brought me through the waters. He brought me and He calls me. Uh, so we look at this. We go back to our text. I want to read it to you again. I, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you, that ye, present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Verse 3 of Ezekiel 47 is that, he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. So he says there in verse 3, and when the man that had the line in his head went forth eastward and measured a thousand cubics, uh, and he brought me through the waters, uh, the waters were to the ankles. Uh, This is talking uh, that ankle deep water is us stepping uh, into or being brought into that place uh, that God wants us to be in. Stepping into that place, uh, can I tell you it's reasonable for you to totally surrender to God. 
it's reasonable for you to fall under the leadership of a pastor and the church. He said that is just reasonable service. The man with a line in his hand measured it, counted the cost, preached the word, carried the burden, and brought you to that place of decision. I'm thankful, Sister Gilda, for the time that I was brought to a crossroad. Why? Through the ministry of the church. Through the ministry of the church that I was brought to a crossroad to know that there had had to be something different in me. That there had to be total surrender. There had to be total submission. Total yielding to the perfect will of God. And can I tell you this morning that that reasonable service is just getting in the waters. But just getting in the waters is not where God wants us to stay. Or there'd have been a period there and we could go home. But God says, and the man of God, the man with the measuring stick in his hand, verse four said, again, again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters. This time the water was, was to the knees. And this, what I believe represents, uh, is a yielding of ourselves uh, to the leadership of the pastor and the leadership of the church and the discipleship of the church. Uh, can I tell you, uh, it's a good thing to yield ourselves to discipleship. It's a good thing to yield ourselves uh, to the will of God, to go, uh, I want the good. He said that you may prove what is the good. Uh, reasonable service is to step out. Uh, and the reasonable service uh, that we find here that we're looking for, uh, and in that good service uh, is to say, I'm not just satisfied uh, with presenting myself uh, and making myself available for salvation uh, and making myself available for God, uh, but I want to know more. Uh, oh, we begin to sing page 6 of the rest back hymnal and we get happy uh, because it says I want to know more uh, about my Lord. Uh, oh, I, all I know is I was in darkness and in hell. Uh, I know a lot about the world. Uh, I know a lot about whatever my hobby or whatever. Uh, I may know a lot about baseball and football uh, and all the things of this world uh, but when I got born again and I surrendered myself to him, uh, to his purpose and that reasonable service, uh, I said I want something more. Uh, I don't want my will but I want his will uh, and I want those good things. Uh, so I'm saying pre Preacher, uh, carry me a little bit further. Uh, preacher, teach me a little bit more about the good way. How many knows what gospel means? Good news. Gospel means good news. So we come and we say, tell me the good news. Sister Debbie, aren't you glad somebody told you the good news? Oh, not just, just power to save, but it's telling you what Jesus did while he was here. That the good news is that Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The good news is that He was in all points tempted as you and I, yet without sin. He was here for 33 and a half years. How much do we know uh, about those 33 and a half years? Uh, scripture leaves a big space there. Uh, but then we find out, uh, even outside of that space, that He did some wonderful things. Uh, and what it was uh, is the example for you and I. Uh, so we are got to yield ourselves to the ministry of the church. You may have got saved and been like my stepmom and thought Job was Job uh, and Psalms was Palms. Uh, but you say, I need to know more. Uh, teach me how to say uh, the words of God. Uh, teach me uh, how to know that it's Genesis, Eticus, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, uh, and go through the books of the Bible. Uh, teach me the Old Testament, the difference between the Old uh, and the New. Teach me uh, about the need for Psalms and Proverbs. Uh, teach me what I need to know about this blood of Jesus that washes away the sins of man. Tell me, preacher, what happened to me? Because I've seen some people that God saved, they didn't know what happened. They just know it changed. They just know that they changed. Paul texted me on that Thursday morning. He said, I don't know what happened. He said, I'm not, I think his words were, I'm not very in touch with my emotional side. But all I know is I, I just feel like I got saved last night. I said, well, what makes you think that you got saved? He said, all I know is things are brighter and my load feels lighter. I said, ding. He didn't know the answer. He just knew that he had uh, threw those hands up and, and, and his heart up uh, and said, hey, uh, it's just reasonable for me to lay down this lifestyle. Uh, it's just reasonable for me to turn my life over to God. Uh, it's just reasonable for me to serve God. You were there. Uh, it just seemed like the reasonable thing to do when you fell under conviction. Uh, it's just, just like somebody put a gun on your reasonable thing. is. Yes. Right. Somebody pulls that gun out. 
go. Wallet, it, it, have it all. You can have whatever. Reasonable. It's reasonable to do that. And when we fall under that convicting power of the Holy Ghost, and when conviction grips our heart, I, I don't know about anybody else, but I know that the reasonable thing for me to do was throw both hands up in the air and say, Lord, I surrender. I, I don't know what all that entails, but I am thine, O Lord. I give myself to you, but I didn't want to stop there. So the man of God picked me up. He measured it. He counted the cost. He studied the Word of God. He broke it down. He figured how far we could go to get me to a place that I needed to be and he measured out and said ankle deep water that's good service the good will of God and he brought me to that place that's a good place to be but hold on he measured a thousand same verse verse 4 and brought me through the waters for to the loins and that represents the acceptable will of God the acceptable will of God. Water to the loins. The acceptable will of God. Why would you call that the acceptable will of God? Well, in the Old Testament, that model shows us that that level was acceptable. Why? Because only the high priest could go any further than there. Only the high priest could go beyond that point. So in that Old Testament model, that's why there had to be a greater sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And, and so there was certain lambs that they could bring and certain offerings that they could give and certain sacrifice that they could bring. But to go any further, to get total atonement, to get total forgiveness, to get everything that they needed, it took a high priest. It took a high priest to go there uh, so they couldn't go any further so that was acceptable. Uh, but can I tell you what was acceptable then uh, is not acceptable now. Uh, because listen, the writer of Hebrews said this, uh, the blood of bulls and rams and goats could no longer be suffice. Uh, there had to be a what? A greater sacrifice. Uh, there was a greater price uh, and his name was Jesus. Uh, the blood of the spotless lamb. Uh, oh, that there was the only begotten of the Father was sent to take our place. He was the scapegoat. He was the spotless lamb. He was the sacrifice. So there was a greater sacrifice that was given. So what was acceptable then? It's going to take a little bit more. Now there's perfection. Why? Because the perfect one came and took our place. Listen to what Hebrews 9, 2, 4, 2 through 4 and then verse 7 says. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table, the shoe bread, which is called the sanctuary, that's what we call the outer court. And the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid around about with gold, wherein was a gold pot and had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. Then verse 7, but in the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. So Moses did go beyond that place. But everyone else, that was it. If to go any further, a priest had to go there. To go any further, uh, it was for the priest. It was for the prophet. It was for the men of God. It was for men like Moses and the, the great patriarchs of old. Uh, for, for those uh, that they had to go through a priest. And they had to well, have that offering and that sacrifice that only uh, a priest could give. No man, no man, not just any man, could step in there. Uh, and he had to go beyond that second veil. Uh, and he had to step into that holy of holies. Uh, so this was the acceptable will of God uh, for us to get to that place and bring that to the high priest so what did the high priest do he brought that sacrifice into the holy of holies and he offered that sacrifice in the holy of holies he brought us to that place and then he brought that sacrifice into the holy of holies and got the forgiveness and got the direction and got the will of God well we read that Moses went up to that mount in that same kind of manner and when he went beyond that point of ordinary or of acceptable, and got into the very presence, engulfed and surrounded by the Spirit of God, Scripture tells us that he had to put on a veil. That he had to put on a veil when he came off because they couldn't handle the Spirit of God and the glory that was upon him just from being in his presence. 
the presence of God was on the mount. Man of God was affected by it. You can find that in Exodus 34, verses 32 through 34. And he said, Afterward, all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. Until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But Moses went, went in before the Lord spake with him. He took the veil off, and he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which was commanded. So, acceptable. That's an acceptable place to be. Water to the loins. You've not just surrendered yourself, committed yourself to salvation, but you've submitted yourself to the work of the Lord, uh, and you bring the sacrifice. You can say, in this day and hour, we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. Uh, you've brought your tithes and your offerings, uh, and, and you've come, and you've sacrificially given towards missions and ministry. Uh, all of those are acceptable things in the work of the Lord. That's a good place to be. The thing is, a lot of people are satisfied with being right there. They're satisfied with being right there uh, to say, I'm a tithe payer. My name's on the roll. Uh, everything's looking good. Uh, God's been good to me. Hey, I'll say praise God. I'll even say praise God in Walmart sometimes. Uh, that God has just been good to me. Uh, I'll come Sunday morning. I'll come Sunday night. Uh, I'll come Wednesday night. You have a revival. I'll be there. Uh, it's just acceptable. Uh, I, I'm in this thing. Hey, it's come up over my loins. I'm waiting in this thing now. Uh, it, it is a part of who I am. Get that now. It is a part of who I am. I want it to be more than a part of who I am. And that's where we see the perfect will of God. How many wants to put the period at the end of verse 4 and say, let's go home, Pastor? Well, you may want that, but you don't get what you want. It ain't Burger King. Because it's God's Word. It's God's Word. And as the disciples said, as they were being brought under oppression, they said, shall we obey man or God? You can say, Brother Jamie, I, I just want to stop right there. I see where you're going, uh, and waiting waters is fine with me. I'm glad to be saved. Uh, I'm glad to be a part of the church. I love you. I love the church. Uh, I love what God is doing here, uh, and, and I'll support it financially, uh, and, and I will bless uh, and do it, be a blessing as much as I can. Uh, and, and I am here, and, and here we are. Uh, and so that's where most pastors want to walk real careful because uh, they got people in a good place. They're in the acceptable will of God, and they're in a good place. They say, I love you, Pastor. I love the church, and I'm going to keep paying my tithes. But when you push and when you challenge, there's a deeper walk. Some folks get mad. Some folks start withholding the tithe. Some folks say, well, I'm walking away. I'm going away. Well, people can do what they want to do, but the man with the reed, with the measuring stick in his hand, he was there on a mandate from God. He was not there on a mandate of man. He was not there uh, because uh, of anything that he wanted, uh, but because God had called him there. Uh, and I believe that God was showing Ezekiel, uh, that may be another man right now, uh, but this is what you're going to fulfill. Uh, this is what every minister, uh, every pastor, uh, through the process of time, they've got to have uh, the measuring stick in their hand. Uh, and can I tell you that we've got the measuring stick in our hand. Uh, oh, I've got the measuring stick. It's the Word of God. Uh, and I have heard from the Word and heard from him in prayer I preached to you Wednesday night about having a place that you can steal away and call upon God in Psalms 91 he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty that one with that measuring stick in his hand said I'm glad to know that you was able to let me carry you through he brought him through can I tell you I've been glad in my six years of pastoral ministry at Middleburg to bring you through Sister Gilda there's been those I had to come over here and carry them to ankle deep water and then come back and bring another one to ankle deep water. But then I had to step there and that one at ankle deep water, I had to measure out and take them a little bit deeper. Oh, it would be a wonderful thing if everybody was in the same depths. But we're not. We all came in at different times and different moments. Does that make the good and acceptable because you're in the good will of God and they're in the acceptable will of God, does that make you any better or any worse than them? No. No. Walk in your maturity. If you're in those ankle deep waters, uh, don't say, man, I sure wish I was swimming. You ain't ready to swim yet. Sister Amanda would not take and throw Tegan out in the deep end, uh, but she'll take her there and put her in that wading pool about now uh, and let her
better splash a little bit uh, in the waters. Uh, but God is sent in. The man of God begins to measure uh, and begins to tap you on the shoulder uh, and say, hop on. Uh, God's told me to measure it out. Uh, and he's measured out a little bit deeper. Where are we going? Uh, God's got another place for you. Uh, so when he's saying, as they were singing this morning, uh, we'll step into the waters, uh, wade out a little bit deeper. Uh, your time's coming to do that. Uh, but maybe right now in your walk with God, uh, that's my place. Uh, just hop on. Just hop on because the man of God that he's placed in your life and the church that God's placed in your life is here to bring you through the waters. Some of you get heavy sometimes. But I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. I wouldn't trade it for the world. I carry people that want to go deeper with a smile on my face. All those that say, I want to know more, teach me more, show me more. And I'll tell them, there's some folks I'd say, hold on. (laughs) Wait, 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 wait. You're not ready. What do you mean I'm not ready? You're not ready. God says when we're ready. God says when we're ready. And when He tells the man of God to measure and take us a little bit deeper, uh, then we'll go a little bit deeper. Uh, So it says there that He uh, measured. Afterward, He measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over. uh, For the waters were risen, waters to swim in, uh, a river that could not be passed over. Did He take him into those waters? No. Because it's hard to swim with somebody else on your back. Maybe in those waters, the man with the measuring stick in his hand, he may have swam in those waters before. He told him about the waters, about the life-giving flow that is in that water and everything that comes from those waters. But he took him to that place. Brother Draven, just go stand back there on that brink of facing those doors, that perfect way. He stopped him right there. And he said, do you see it? Do you see it? He took him to that place. Now look, Jesus went to Calvary to give us access to that place waters to swim in that Ezekiel saw he went to Calvary for that very purpose Mark 5 or excuse me Mark 15 37 38 reads like this and Jesus cried with a loud voice uh, and gave up the ghost and the veil of the temple was rent in twain uh, from top to bottom now before that time Ezekiel was seeing something that didn't even exist yet Uh, before that time the only one that could see beyond uh, where he was at was the high priest Uh, but he was showing Ezekiel something uh, that was going to happen that's why it's called a prophet it's a prophecy uh, of what's going to come to pass there's deep waters there's waters swim in and he said can you see it there's the perfect will of God you're an acceptable will of God are you satisfied with the acceptable or can you see he brought him to the brink of the perfect will of God and that veil of the temple was rent so he could see that and from that time over 2,000 years ago until now we can step boldly into the holiest because of that price that he paid on Calvary Hebrews 10, 19, and 221 says this, Having, brethren, therefore boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, uh, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. There, there's none of us that's dove into deep waters with boldness that did not know how to swim. But when we've been tested and we've been taught and we've learned in the ankle deep and the knee deep and the loin deep, we learned how to swim. We learn to test the spirits and to see if they are God. We were discipled. We were taught. We're ready for whatever thus saith the Lord. And now we're brought to that brink of that river to swim in. And man, it's looking appeasing to us. Before, it was very nerve-wracking to us. That's why we needed somebody to bring us through. We needed the pastor. We needed the leadership of the church uh, to bring us through. Uh, and now we're looking, and no doubt Ezekiel's chomping at the bit saying, I can jump in there. I can swim in there. I can go from here. I can go from uh, loin deep water into waters to swim in. I'm ready to go. I'm ready. Hold on. I'm not bringing you in there. I can't bring you to that place. He said in 2 Corinthians three twelve through 14, seeing then that we have such hope, 
We use great plain, plainness of speech and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, uh, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Uh, but their minds were blinded, for unto this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Uh, now understand something. That veil is still there uh, for those who want to live in that acceptable will of God. They, can't, they say, I can't go any further. I can't go any further. This is far as I can go. Absolutely correct. But it's not as far as you will go when you accept the fact that Jesus paid the price at Calvary and the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. Between uh, the, uh, if you will, the acceptable and the perfect will. Between the loin deep and the rivers to swim in, uh, between the holy, uh, the inner court and the holy of holies, uh, that veil was rent, giving us access. Uh, we didn't have to wait uh, on a high priest to go. We didn't have to wait for somebody uh, to take us there. We didn't have to wait for any of those things. Uh, Jesus paid that price, uh, and so the man with the reed, uh, the measuring stick in his hand, uh, I believe that he can say what I can say this morning. I have been in the holy of holies. I have been in the very presence of God. I have been there in rivers to swim in. And he said, everywhere the river flows, there is life. I know what it is to swim in the deep waters of God. And there's some in this house this morning that have been swimming in the perfect will of God, living in the perfect will of God, and knows that what there is there, man, it's great. It's wonderful. But now we understand something today. That Moses went into the presence of God. He went into waters to swim in uh, and when he came down he had to put a veil on uh, but can I tell you this morning uh, I've been in the presence of God this week I've heard from God this week uh, and I don't have a veil on this morning uh, uh, let the glory of God uh, fill the house today uh, let the anointing of the Holy Ghost uh, fill this place today uh, because there is waters to swim in uh, there is a good will of God there is an acceptable will of God uh, but his desire for the whole church uh, is to be in the perfect will of God uh, and we say Listen, this morning, I don't want a veil over it. I don't want a watered-down version of it. I don't want a, a part that's sugar-coated. But I want the genuine. He said in Ezekiel 47 and 6, I'm coming back to you. I hadn't forgot you, son. He said unto me, Son of man, talking to you, have you seen it? Have you seen this? He said, yeah. I'm not carrying you again. Just act like I'm carrying you. So he brought me. This is where we left him. He brought me back. Wait, I see it. But he brought me back. Stand right there. He brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. Wait a minute. I was driving for the perfect will of God, and I was so close to the perfect will of God. But the problem was, son, I brought you there. I brought you through ankle-deep water. I brought you through knee-deep water. I brought you through loin-deep water. And I showed you the potential of a future in God's perfect will that waits for you outside those doors. In ministry, mission field, pastoral ministry, evangelistic ministry, singing ministry, whatever it is. I'm not calling Draven to preach. He's just my helper this morning. This is, all, this is any and all of you this morning. He's a representation of any or all of us. Remember I told you a few weeks ago, as far as I can take the gospel is to your ears. But if you're willing, if you're willing, I can bring you into ankle-deep water, knee-deep water, loin-deep water. But I can't take you to waters to swim in. But I can bring you back to the brink of the river. And he said, son of man, you see it? And what did you say when we were standing out there? Yes. Do you want it? Yes. But then I brought him back to the river bank. And now it's going to be up to you to step into the waters. Wait out a little bit deeper. That's going to be up to him. I'm not doing the work anymore. How many of you still dress your 18-year-old? If you do, don't raise your hand. If they're not handicapped, you better not be dressing them. How many of you still brush their teeth? Sister Mosley, you live with Sister Rhonda. Do you get her up every morning and get her dressed for work? I wouldn't think so. Why? Because she taught her how to do that. She taught her how to do that. 
We think that's silly, that's crazy, but yet we come to church and we expect week after week, month after month, year after year, for us to be taught the same thing. I put something comical on Facebook the other day, uh, and it's Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory, uh, and Gene Wilder and that face that only Gene Wilder can make had that face, look on his face, uh, and it says that look what the pastor gets uh, when you ask him to pray you out of something that he already warned you about. You know that look? I've probably given it to you before. It's up to you now. He's standing at the brink. I can disciple you. I can bring you through the waters. But I can't swim for you. I can teach you how to swim. But I can't swim for you. It's up to you to dive into that perfect will. But you're not going to dive in from the brink of the river. But you're going to have to wade out there. If you go to the brink of the river to dive in, you're going to dive in to ankle deep water. You're going to break your neck. But you have to Go through it, through every process that you were already brought through. If you've ever trained anybody, you've taken them through the whole process, and then you take take it all apart, and you tell them, now you do it. It looked easy when they were doing it because they knew what they were doing. But now when we do it, we begin to wait. How did he come through these waters with me on his back? Because I can't hardly seem to make it through on my own. But I'm going to keep pressing on. Why? As Elijah said to Elijah, I want a double portion of what he's got. So brother, brother Draven is saying, I know the pastor has carried me. I've been his pastor for six years now, through all of his teen years. He's graduated. He can say, I know that brother Jamie has carried me through and taught me things about walking with God. And he's had me on his back and he's walked through them. He said, here I am. I'm a lot younger than brother Jamie and I want it. So I think if he can do it, I can too. If he wants it, I want it. And as they were told last weekend, it's their time. But can I tell you, it's not just these young people's time. It's each of our time. We've been brought back to that brink, and we've got to receive the fullness of his will for our lives, but we've got to do it. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, you say, I want it. How many this morning says, I I I want more than the good and the acceptable. I want the perfect will of God. Well, you know what I'm fixing to tell you, right? You haven't forgot the message title, have you? Prove it. Prove it. First Thessalonians 5.21, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. So, you've stepped into waters of reasonable service. Each of you respectfully have been brought through by his servant who has counted the cost, measured the distance to that good and that acceptable will of God and brought you to the brink of swimming waters to the perfect will. But now he has brought you back to the river brink. Brought you back to that place, and now you stand there at the brink of the river. And you know who it's up to? It's not up to me anymore. It's up to you. Raven, it's up to you. I brought you through all of those waters. Now, what do you want to do? Do you want those waters to swim in? If you do... I want you just to wade yourself down that aisle through all those levels and bust your way through those doors which represent that swimming water. It's up to you. See, he's not going fast. He's wading through those waters because those waters are tough to wade through even if you've been taught. They're tough. This walk is not, a, it's not an easy thing. But when you break through, when you break through to that place, uh, now you stand there and you're at that place. Uh, are you ready to do what Draven just demonstrated to us? Thank you, son. Uh, to demonstrate to us uh, that there is a mission field out there. Uh, that each one of us is a missionary. Uh, are you ready to be? How many could say this morning, uh, you just don't have to raise your hand, but I know that I'm in the good will of God. That's all right. Some of us just got saved, and we're in that good will of God. That's where you need to be if you just got saved. But how many would say this morning, I've waited a little bit deeper, and I'm in that acceptable will of God, and it feels good to be in that place. I I don't have to break it down to you again. I already did, but you can say within your heart, I'm in that acceptable will of God. But whether you're in the good will or the acceptable will, each one of us is saying, my desire is the perfect will of God. Are you ready? To be in His perfect will. If you are, prove it by standing this morning. You've depended on the pastor and the ministry of the church, which you should. Don't think this morning that I'm saying that's cumbersome. Don't think for a moment this morning that I'm saying that's a burden I wish that I did not have. No, that's our calling. 
That's our purpose. That's the reason for the church. That's what these altars are for. That's why God has given us pastors and teachers and evangelists and missionaries to help carry us. He brought me through. He brought me through. And I count it an honor and a privilege to help bring people through the ankle-deep water, the knee-deep water, the loin-deep water. But are you ready for the perfect will of God? If you are, it's up to you to prove it, to walk in it, to step into the waters and wade out a little bit deeper. Sister Mary, could y'all come and sing that again this morning? I hope you don't tell me no. Step into the water. Wade out a little bit deeper. Who's ready to do that this morning? I'm going to pray this morning. I want you to just, as you step out of your seat, as you step in off that river brink, wherever you were at in your walk, maybe this morning that you've still got time to go, that you're going to depend on the pastor and the church to carry you through those levels. That's all right, but our ultimate goal is the perfect will of God this morning. And what we're saying in this response to the altar this morning is I know I've got to go through the process, but my ultimate desire is the perfect will of God. Father, we love you today. And thank you, Lord, that you have given us everything that we need to walk in the perfect will of God. To be in the depths of ministry where everywhere the river flows, there's life. Lord God, I pray that you'd help us and touch us this morning to wade out a little bit deeper. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As they begin to sing, if that's your desire, why don't you step into the waters? Wade out a little bit deeper today. Step into the water. Wade out a little bit deeper.
service Monday night over at 103rd Street Church of God and Brother Colley was preaching about that thought. He said either you want it or you don't. It was the title of his message. He talked about Moses, how he went up the first time to the top of the mountain and he got in the presence of God. The presence of God surrounded him and God wrote the Ten Commandments. He gave it to him and he brought it down. When he brought it down, we know what he ran into. He ran into a people that had convinced Aaron and them to melt all the gold and make them a golden calf to worship Moses lost it he dropped the commandments of stone broke them and he said there that being in the presence of God was not enough because when he came off the mountain he was still influenced by the people sent him back to the mountain when he went back to the mountain instead of God writing the commandments in the stone Moses put the, the commandments in the stone as God directed him and when he came back off that mountain something different happened that time because while he was on the mountain that time he not only got in the presence of God but he allowed the presence of God to get into him out into our workplaces our schools and all of that and we're going to be influenced by the environment but when we get out I'm not the river about something that I am brother Steve I am the channel in which the river flows through. You are the channel in which the river flows through. Every, I guarantee you this, everywhere the Spirit of God, the river flows, there is life. The Spirit flow, Spirit of God, flow through me. Spirit of God, flow through me everywhere I go. I don't want there to be death and destruction, heartache and despair. But everywhere I flow, I want the Spirit of God to flow in me and flow through me. Because there's lives out there that need that life-giving flow of the Spirit. It can't stay here, but it originates from here. If you read back and you study there in Ezekiel, it says that those waters started somewhere from the altar in the house of God. Came across that threshold. We're looking at a world out there that's messed up. But they're going to stay messed up out there if we keep sitting in here. They're going to stay messed up out there if we keep staying in a place of complacency here. It's up to us to say, God, I want to be that channel in which you flow through. Because I want that life-giving flow to flow throughout these communities in these areas. Do you want that? Do you want that? I'm not looking for lip service. I'm looking for you to prove it. God's not looking for lip service. He's looking for you to prove it. So why don't we go out the doors of this church this week and prove it in the life that we live. We say, God, I'm getting in your word. I'm getting in that prayer closet pastor preached about Wednesday night. I'm diving in. I'm going He's carried me through and He showed me some things through the Word of God in my walk. And now I'm going to prove it. I'm going to walk through them on my own. may have thought I was crazy carrying my kids up and down the aisle this morning, but I just felt that I needed to do that to show them something. That I have carried them from the time that they were born. Taught them. They've been raised in a pastor's home. And I've taught them. Not only a pastor of a church, but the pastor of my home. Before I was your pastor, I was their pastor. And every dad here this morning has got kids. You're the pastor of your home. You're the priest of that home. Scripture tells us that. And I've carried them through all that process of how to get to the altar. But then I carried them back to the back of the church again for a reason. And I left it up to them to say it's up to you to find your way back to that altar. There's going to be times when daddy's not there. There's going to be times when mama's not there. But God's always there and that desire for him always has to be there. We've instilled it in, put it in them. He said, just know that we put it there and believe God will bring them to that place that they need to be. We've got to prove it. Stand with me. I could preach all day. I probably already have. Father, we love you today.